then we will, <coughs> then we'll keep going. <coughs> if you'd like to just look at this one, you may. Um, and if you don't want it at the end, you can just pass it back. That's okay. Um, so the front gives us some basic information that we're going to be looking at today. Today's going to be mostly about people. Uh, we've uh, up to up to today in the in the first missionary journey we were talking a lot about activities and places but today as we begin to look at the second missionary journey we're going to look a little bit more at the people who are part of the second missionary journey so Paul's compa companions on the second missionary journey and this is from Acts 1540 to Acts 1610 and then we're going to, then next week or, when, or whenever after that, then we're going to keep on going. So we are, uh, we're going to look at people, mostly at people today. And <coughs> I, I want to remind you of where, of where we were when we finished. This was, I think, the beginning of November. Uh, if you want to, uh, when, once we get started, we're going to look at the, you can turn to the back side of it. Um, and uh, uh, if you want to take notes, you can on the back side. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about what's on the front. I'm going to just preach it today. But you can, uh, you can look at it. And then I've given you for further, study, uh, for further study at the bottom. The one thing you can do is, uh, is just take a look very quickly. at Look at the time icon. If you'll just look quickly at the time icon on the front page. Uh, Paul's first missionary journey was around 46 to 48 what started around 46 went to about 48 AD maybe it was about a year and a half then he he stayed he and Barnabas stayed in Antioch for about a year and then we don't know exact times but that's what we can figure out and then he says to Barnabas hey let's go back and let's visit the churches and so the second missionary journey is roughly 49 to 52 AD Later on, we're going to look at the third missionary journey. And the third missionary journey, you'll see that he waits about a year, and then he goes again. So it seems that Paul has a, Paul has a pattern. Um, it's a little bit amazing to me that um, he takes only a year, if you will, to rest. Because I, I think about, maybe it's because I've gotten older now, but sometimes when I go on missions trips or I'm traveling here or there, I, I come back to Hong Kong and I'm just wiped out um, and I haven't been stoned and I haven't been opposed and things like that haven't happened to me as happened to Paul but um, this is the pattern that we see in his life so when we ended the last time we ended with conflict didn't we uh, he, they came back and <coughs> right after that was the first big conflict of the church it threatened to split the church in half and it threatened to divide Jewish the Jewish part of the church and the Greek part of the church. But people humbled themselves and they allowed God to work in their hearts and everybody compromised, not on truth, not on essentials, but on the things where I can let go of this. It's not essential to salvation. I can let it go. And because people were willing to let go of some things, harmony and unity were restored. So often, brothers and sisters, we are unwilling to let go of things, right? We're unwilling to let go. And when we are unwilling to let go of non-essentials, there will never be harmony and there'll never be unity. Um, but we see this beautiful picture. Then another conflict arises, and this one is between Barnabas and Paul. And so <coughs> about a year has passed, and Paul says, we talked about this a lot last time, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the, the new believers are doing. Let me say something right here. Many of us are influential in leading other people to the Lord. May I say something to us this morning that is key. It's, it's, it's key in other people's lives. Evangelism is good. Evangelism is needed. Evangelism is necessary. We must share the gospel. We must, must preach the word. But brothers and sisters, evangelism is not enough. It's not enough. There must be follow-up. Follow there must be discipleship. If we lead people to the Lord and <coughs> never follow up 
and never feed. It's just the same as bringing a baby physically into the world and just kind of throwing them out and saying, hey, hope you make it. Um, what baby would make it on its own? Probably not. Evangelism and discipleship go together. They go together. What did Jesus tell his disciples? Matthew 28. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That's evangelism. And then what does he say beyond that? Make disciples, right? Make disciples. Teach them to obey. Baptize them. Teach them to obey. And so there is a, there's a follow-up that must be. May I say to you, if you have led somebody to the Lord... Follow up with them. Pray for them. Go back to them. And if for some reason you cannot, then really keep praying for them and try to bring somebody else into their lives, uh, into their life who will follow up. And so Paul's, Paul's direction and Paul's desire is very, very good. The only problem is <coughs> Paul and Barnabas disagree. Paul has a very strong focus. <coughs> and he says, let's go back. Let's see how they're doing. Barnabas... <coughs> Pardon me, you're, you're, you'll hear me cough a little bit this morning, just ignore it. Okay, it's much better than it's been. Barnabas, because of his makeup and because of his gifts, has a slightly different focus. Yes, there is discipleship. Yes, there is follow-up. But Barnabas' gift was encouragement. And that encouragement included a young man, his relative, John Mark, who failed on the first trip, the one who gave up on the first trip. And Barnabas, as an encourager, sees there's something good in this young man. There's still hope. Yes, he blew it, but you know what? He can make it. He just needs another chance. How many of you needed, have needed another chance at times? How many of you have needed a third chance? And a fourth chance. God is the God of second chances and more. And brothers and sisters, may we learn, listen, may we learn to give grace to others in the same way God has given grace to us. Yes? Amen. Yes. Yes. I, I think sometimes we are, we receive grace upon grace upon grace, and yet, oh, we're so hard with other Christians, aren't we? We're so hard. But... Jesus taught about that and, and <coughs> in his parables. And if people are going to make it, if we're going to keep relationship, listen, if you want a perfect friendship, you're going to be looking a long time. You will never have a perfect friendship. People are going to fail. People are going to fall short. People are going to disappoint you. But you get up and you keep on going. Extend grace. Extend second chances. And keep on going just as... God has extended second chances and grace to you and to me as well. Amen? Amen? Amen. Truly, brothers and sisters. But in this case, Barnabas and Paul can't agree. And I don't want to re-preach that message because we have we talked about that before. And I really want to, to um, I really want to cover all of this part. So, but Paul disagrees because John Mark had had deserted them. Really, really strong word. And so something is going to something's gonna have to happen. Um, what happens? They cannot agree, and they separate. And if you absolutely cannot agree with a fellow Christian, you really can't work it out for whatever reason, you separate. Now, that's not choice number one, but if, it, if you can't have choice number one, then you take choice number two, which is to separate. Listen, don't continue to live in conflict with other believers. Don't do it. Don't do it. You can't live that way. Your heart will fill with bitterness and you will damage other people. You'll be damaged as well. So separate if you need to, but don't separate in anger. Don't separate in, well, huh, we'll see. Instead, separate. Keep on going. Sometimes I think God, when we come to things like this and there's conflict, I think sometimes God probably has a change in direction and has a change in planning. But we are so stuck on things, um, we have a hard time of letting go at times, don't we? We have a hard time changing directions or, or trying something new. God help us to accept new plans and accept new directions without strife and without division. Instead, say, okay, God, there's a change. There's a change. Because what comes out of this? What comes out of this is this. John Mark, who failed, 
is rehabilitated. That's a strong word, but he is rehabilitated, right? Barnabas takes him off and he's rehabilitated. And later on, <coughs> we've talked about this, John Mark is useful to Barnabas. John Mark later on is useful to Paul. Paul later on says, send Mark to me. Send John Mark to me. He's helpful to me. Paul says that. Not only that, John Mark later on is referred to in one of Paul's letters. Did you know that? In, uh, sorry, in one of Peter's letters. In 1 Peter 5, I think, it's, I think it's chapter 5, do you know what Peter says about John Mark? Peter says, my dear son, Mark, John Mark. And I was thinking about that. Um, Paul never calls John Mark his son. Now, he becomes a worker, and he becomes helpful to him. Another person is called his son. Who's the person who's called his son? We're going to meet him this morning. That's right. Timothy, uh, Paul is going to say, my dear son. But Peter is the one that's going to say, my son, John Mark. I wonder why it was Peter is the one that, that, that calls John Mark his son. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe you haven't even noticed it before. Is it possible that one who himself failed badly and received the grace of God and was restored to fellowship was also able to extend that grace to someone who also had failed and could be restored? I think so. That's what I think. I think sometimes failures are the making of us. Did you know that? Not that we want to fail. I don't want to fail. You don't want to fail. But in God's hands, when we blow it at times, if we will humble ourselves. Now, if we stay proud and we guard ourselves and say, God can't do a lot with that. But if we will humble ourselves, God can take our failures and make something of us. Yeah? He did with Peter. I think he did with John Mark as well. And so Barnabas takes John Mark off. Now, was the devil in the middle of this? I think so. I really do. Because they had a sharp disagreement. The devil wanted to destroy this, this um, very effective evangelism team. But what happens when the devil gets in the middle of something? God gets in the middle of it too. And if we let him, God can bring something even better out of what the devil is trying to mess up. Because here, young John Mark is rehabilitated. Here, <coughs> instead of having one evangelism team, what happens? There are now two evangelism teams. Barnabas and John Mark go off, right? And Paul chooses Silas, and they go off in another direction. So instead of one, now there are two. Instead of dividing, which is what the devil does, God multiplies, yeah? Amen. God can always multiply. God can always multiply. And so Barnabas takes John Mark. They sail off for Cyprus. Keep that in mind. We're not going to talk a lot about geography today, but keep that in mind. They go to Cyprus. Why do they go to Cyprus? Remember? Home area, right? That was his home area. That was Barnabas's home area. Paul chose Silas. So if you've got your notes, you can look. There's the first new companion and co-worker. He's lost Barnabas, but he's gained Silas as well. And so <coughs> Paul chooses Silas. And uh, again, then he, he travels through Syria and Cilicia. So why does Paul do this? Although the situation has changed, the call of God has not changed. Listen, brothers and sisters, sometimes God has put something on your heart. He puts a burden on your heart. He puts a calling on your heart. But the circumstances don't work out. The situation doesn't work out. What you thought was going to be is not going to be. Do you give up? Or do you regroup? Examine your heart and wait on the Lord. If the calling and the burden have not yet changed in your heart, God is still saying, I want you to do this. Then you wait on God and you say, okay, God, what I expected, that's not going to be. Then how else do I fulfill your call on my life? How else do I do this? I know, I know I'm speaking to some of you this morning because God has put something in your heart and circumstances have been difficult for you and you've wanted to kind of give up because well, it's not working out the way I wanted it, the way I thought it was going to work out. Well, sometimes God has another way of working it out. So don't give up and don't stop. What if Barnabas and Paul had said, well, forget it. 
the perfect, the, the dynamic duo, that was Robin and Batman, right? The dynamic duo has been destroyed. We can't forget it. Well, all of this that we read about in the rest of the, in the rest of the New Testament would never have happened. But both of them pick up, regroup, and go on. And that's what you and I have to do as well when things like this when things like this come our way as well. Please don't look at this and just think, hey, well, this is old church history. I'm not a Paul. I'm not a Barnabas. We find ourselves in these examples, don't we? We do in, in our own way. Let the Holy Spirit this morning open your eyes to see where you and I fit in this as well. In this as well. And so they, divide, so they separate, but they multiply. He chooses Silas. And then look at verse 41. You'll see this throughout Acts. Verse 41, again, is a uh, summary scripture. It's like a summary passage. Then he traveled throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. That's what he said he was going to do, right? Now, where does Paul go? Where do Paul and Silas go? Syria and Cilicia. Ah, okay. So let's talk about that for just a minute, and then we'll talk about Silas. Look with me at the, <coughs> excuse me at the map for just a minute. Um, I really liked this map when I found it. Um, if you look, this was the first missionary journey, okay? Take a quick look. It started in Antioch, right? So, the, the, uh, uh, so it started in Antioch and then it went down to Seleucia. They went to Cyprus first, right? Because that was the home area. And then they circled all, all the way up in here and then they came back. Okay, take a look at that. So look at the second missionary journey, much longer and a little bit different. Instead of going, so they went down to Jerusalem, then they went back up to Antioch, because Silas had been in Jerusalem. Then he came up here. Look at what happens. He doesn't go to Cyprus. Sorry, I gotta come back over here so I can be so I can be recorded. He doesn't go to Cyprus. Why not? Because Barnabas is going to Cyprus, right? So where does Paul where do Paul and Silas go? They go this way instead, and so they get they go to the last churches. Now what is significant about Paul and Silas going that way? Saul of Tarsus. So he goes through his home area. Barnabas goes through his home area. Saul, Paul now heads off through his home area. So there's a difference um, in how they go. Nevertheless, here's what I want you to see, brothers and sisters. Is the work of God and is the plan of God fulfilled and carried out? Things change, but is it carried out? Yes. The churches here are covered. Barnabas and John Mark go there. The churches there are covered. Paul and Silas go there. Why is Silas a great choice? Have we heard of Silas before? Everybody, oh, everybody go ahead and nod your heads. Even though you don't remember, you've heard of Silas before. Yes. Thank you, Pastor Renee. <laughs> Where was Silas? Where did we meet him before? Remember where they were, when there was the big church uh, disagreement? Silas was one of the leaders in Jerusalem, and when the Jerusalem church said, okay, uh, they don't have to follow all the Jewish traditions to be saved, let's write a letter to the Antioch church. Silas is one of those that takes the letter from Jerusalem to the Antioch church. So he's a great choice because Paul says, we're going to go visit these churches that are a mixture of Jew and Greek and a lot more Greek. So here is, is Silas who has proven himself to be a man who stands in the middle. He's trusted by the Jewish church. He's trusted by the Greek church. Greek church. Most of all, he's loyal to God. And so he goes off. What was his gift? His gifting was a prophet. What's a prophet? A prophet is not someone who says, uh, a prophet is not only someone who says, the Lord shows me that, ba, 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 ba. although that is, can be the role of a prophet, the prophet in the New Testament is one who brings an inspired and a timely message from God. Oh, how the churches need that, don't they? Silas is a perfect companion. He's a perfect companion for Paul in this. Um, <coughs> what else do we know about Silas? Silas was Jewish. That's great. That's needed. If they're going to go into synagogues, they need somebody who's Jewish because they went into the synagogues first. But Silas is also a Roman citizen. That's great too. Why? Because they're going to be re reaching Greeks and they're going to be going to, to, to Roman and Greek areas. And so Silas is a perfect companion, so off they go. So he has, a, he has a companion, he has a co-worker, but he doesn't have a helper, right? So we have Paul and Silas. So what happens next? 
let's see. Okay, I'm sorry. I know this is a, <laughs> I know this is a long, a long passage, um, but just, just stay with me on this. So we go forward. They off they go to Derby. Just remember the map. Um, sorry. Okay. They go this way. Then they go here, here, here. In these. These cities actually were fairly close together, okay? So Paul and Silas went first to Derby and then to Lystra, where there was a young disciple named Tim Timothy. Woohoo! His helper, his assistant has arrived. So we're going to take a little bit of time. Let's look at this new helper, this new assistant, to replace John Mark, right? They've lost John Mark. He's lost John Mark, but he still needs a helper. You say, why does he need a helper? Well, somebody's got to carry his bags. Somebody's got to go get him some water when he's thirsty because he's been preaching. Somebody's got to help with the new converts and the new disciples. You say, things like that? Yeah, things like that. Somebody's got to go buy train tickets. No, you know what I mean. <laughs> Somebody's got to go book passage for them if they're going to go on the, on the ship. Those are things that, that a young assistant would have done. He would have also helped with preaching and teaching, but he would have started with really, really practical things. And so <coughs> they, meet, they meet up with this young disciple named Timothy. His mother was a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. Okay, and then look at verse 2. Timothy was well thought of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium, so Paul wanted him to join them on their journey. Now, I've got a question right away. What is there different about uh, John, Mark, and Timothy? Because Timothy, he sees, he says, yeah, let's take him. I'm sure John Mark looked pretty good in the beginning too, right? So what is there about Timothy that makes him a good companion? and <coughs> uh, Sorry, a, a, new, a good helper. So... Let's look at some of these things. So he goes first to Derby, then to Lystra. There's a young disciple named Timothy. His mother was a Jewish believer. His father's Greek. So Paul has a co-worker, and now he's going to have a helper or a young assistant. What is there about Timothy that catches his eye? Because there would have been other young people in this church as well. What catches his eye? Well, first of all, look with me. Look, what, look how Timothy, look how, how he is, uh, how he Sorry, I'm going to end with a preposition. Look how he is referred to. <laughs> that was really bad. Um, his reference. He's called a disciple. That sounded awful. I can't stand that. <laughs> That's from my back. Anyhow, um, he's referred to as a disciple. He's not just a young man. He's called a disciple. And he's a young man. A lot of people think that he might still have been a teenager at this point. And I really hope those of you that are parents are listening carefully today because there, there are some messages for those of you who are parents. There are there's some messages for us here. So his mother was a Jewish believer and his father is Greek. First of all, his life and his reputation. He's a young he's a disciple and he is well thought of by believers in the area, not just in one, in one place, but in the area. So Paul wanted him to join on their journey. I want to say something to you this morning. Here at Lighthouse, we spend quite a lot of time and we, we have more and more, we really focus on the youth of Lighthouse. And I don't know, some of you may think, ah, well, you know, they're just youth. We're, we're doing other things. May I tell you something as we look at this passage? Do not despise youth. Don't look down on them. Do they still have to be proven? Yes. Do they still have to mature? Yes. Do they still have to grow up? Sure they have to grow up. But don't knock and don't put down the potential and the possibility of young people before God. Here we see this young man called Timothy who was probably in his late teens, maybe 20, 21, but probably in his teens. And there is, there is enough of zeal for the Lord. There's enough commitment. There's enough discipleship. There's enough proven Christian life in his life that Paul says, this young man, it's worth to take on this trip. And Paul knew it was going to be tough. Paul knew it was going to be difficult. Listen, you can, I, I think, I think we can expect more of our youth at times than we are expecting of them. I, I, I do. I believe it. We see this again and again in the Bible. There's zeal. There's potential. There's unbound energy um, when some of us get tired, when some of us whatever. Youth can keep on going. Don't look down on the potential that's there. Value and guard and look up to and pray for as well. And so here we have this young man, probably still in his late teens. We don't know exactly. What else about him uh, <coughs> is, is noteworthy? Timothy is biracial. 
um, if you if you hadn't noticed that before, up to now, uh, Barnabas, although he had a although he was a a, a Greek influenced Jew, Barnabas was complete. He was Jewish. John Mark was Jewish. Silas, although he's a Roman citizen, he's completely Jewish. Timothy is not. For the first time, one of the missionaries that's going to go out is biracial. He is his mother is Jewish. His father is Greek. And not only that, we're going to look at it in just a minute. His father. Uh, if you look at this, his father would not have been a Christian. You say, how can you tell that? The Bible doesn't say that because Timothy was not circumcised. And as a Greek, uh, a Greek father, he wouldn't have allowed his son to be circumcised. So his father would not have been a believer. And if you and I could read Greek this morning, do you know what else we would see? The language of the Greek indicates probably at this point his father was dead. Okay, so he has, uh, his, he's still with his mother, and we're going to see, and his grandmother in just a minute. So here we see this young man, and I want to talk just a little bit, especially to those of you who are parents and grandparents this morning. Never underestimate the power of your influence in your children's lives or in your grandchildren's lives. The father was Greek was not, had not been a believer. We don't know at what point he would have passed away, but he's, as far as we know, he's not on the scene anymore. And yet, we see in Timothy a disciple, a young man who is well thought of. Where did that come from? Well, Timothy made some choices for himself, but it was more than Timothy's choice as well. We're going to look at some other scriptures in just a minute. In fact, let's go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that, but I want us to go ahead and look at that. Oh, so look at this, uh, Acts 16, 1 through 5. Then I want you to see what, what Paul writes later. Look at what he says to Timothy. I remember many, many years later, he says, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois. Who was the first one in the family to become a Christian? Grandmother Lois. Okay. Who was the second one to become a Christian? And your mother Eunice. Ah, oh, Chris and Janice, is that where the name for, of your daughter came from? <laughs> Janice says, no. Oh, that would have been a good story. <laughs> Okay, and Eunice. And then he says, and I know that same faith continues strong in you. Listen, you may be part of an extremely ungodly family. There may be influences in your family that are so opposed to God and his ways. Don't concede your family. Don't give up and say, well, I can't help it. I'm doing the best I can, but it's too hard. It's not too hard in God. Is it going to be difficult? Yes, it's going to be difficult. The enemy fights for your children. The enemy fights for your youth, and he wants to. Why? He knows if he can get them, he's got something. But God knows if he can get them, he's got something as well. Don't concede your youth. Don't concede your children. Don't say, well, I'm alone in the family. There's nobody else. It's just me. Lois was saved first, Eunice was saved next, and then Timothy was saved as well. And he became a disciple, and he was well thought of, and later on he becomes, he becomes pastor of the church at Ephesus for a while and at Corinth for a while. He is instrumental. He becomes a co-worker of Paul's. He's a son in the faith, but even, even, even better, Paul at one point says, I have nobody like him who cares for the churches. How could Paul say this? Could anybody else care for the churches more than Paul? And yet Paul says of this young man, Timothy, there's nobody else like him who cares for the churches as he does. Don't give up your influence. Don't let go of your children and your grandchildren. And if you have, it's time to stop, make a stand, and start praying, and start gaining back the ground that has been lost. Don't let them go. Don't give them up. The stakes are too high. So Paul says this, there's the, there's the influence of the mother and the grandmother. And then a little bit later in the same letter, look at this. Oh, what a wonderful spiritual DNA um, his parents and his, his mother and grandmother give him. He says, you've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. This probably means that even before they realized Jesus is our Savior, they were learning the Old Testament scriptures and they were learning righteousness in that way and then when they heard Jesus then they accepted Jesus that's probably what this means but look at this beautiful picture 
this beautiful picture of godly parents and godly grandparents who change a life. You do not know among children and, the grand and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and others where there is another Timothy, where, there is a, where, where there's another John Mark that needs, rehabilita re needs rehabilitating. And some of you may say, my children aren't, or my grandchildren, they're not Timothys, they're John Marks, they've blown it or whatever. Well, John Mark was rehabilitated and useful too. Don't concede your families. Don't concede your children. Fight for them. Fight for them. Fight for them. So we have this beautiful picture. I want to say something else, and, and I know this is sensitive, but I want to say it anyhow. The Lord put it on my heart. Parents and grandparents and those of you that have your children that you're responsible for, I want to ask you something this morning. Who have you allowed into their lives? And who have you allowed to care for your children and grandchildren? What is their faith? What is their character? What is their stand? Do they have more hands-on your children and gra grandchildren than you do? Watch out. Watch out. Beyond your salvation, you have nothing more precious than your relationship if you're married with a spouse or than the children that God has given you. Take that responsibility seriously. Take it seriously. You can pass on spiritual DNA that will establish your children when the storms of life roar and they will make it. They will make it when hard times come. And I'll tell you something this morning, brothers and sisters, I think hard times are coming. I think they're not that far away. And some of you are facing hard times already in our meeting this morning. Uh, some of you, uh, Moses was sharing about how shocked they were to find out the prevalence of uh, uh, the availability of drugs to young, to young kids, to young children. What are you instilling in your children? What are you, what are you building up in them? And if you have brought people, sorry to say it, I'm just, say, just speaking frankly, if you have brought people in to care for your children and your grandchildren, are they trustworthy to impart to your children and grandchildren spiritual DNA that will help them to stand and to make it? Or if you are here and your children and your grandchildren are in another country, what are their strongest influences? The Bible says, what will it profit a man or a woman if he will gain the whole world and lose his soul? You don't want to provide everything for your families. They've got all the nicest clothes. They've got all the latest that gadgets and this and that. And then they go to hell because they haven't gotten the spiritual DNA from you. Listen, we have a responsibility before God, a privilege before God, an opportunity before God. Don't abdicate that. Don't abdicate that. And let the, let the Holy Spirit, if, you, if you're upset with me, I'm, I'm sorry. Get upset with the Lord. Talk to Him about it. And if you need to make some changes, I mean it. If you need to make some changes, make some changes. Some of the changes may be difficult, but make the changes. Now, what's the other influence in Timothy's life? Because as we meet Timothy here, <coughs> he's a young man, but there are other influences as well. Because some of us this morning are standing here or sitting here, and we are saying, I ain't got no kids. <laughs> I don't have children. I don't have that influence. And what I want to say to you is neither can you abdicate and say, well, that's for parents and grandparents. I don't think you can say that. You may be single without children. You may be married without children. And I want you to look at this part of the story that is part of it as well. Look with me. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, I thank God for you night and day. I constantly remember you in my prayers. Paul never had flesh and blood children from his, from his own seed. Never had that. But he had something that was as fulfilling. And it was in a spiritual son. If you do not have children from your own body, you may still have spiritual children. Now some of you are saying, oh, Pastor Jennifer, yeah, but you're not a parent and you don't. You think just because somebody is single, they don't long for family and children? Not true. Listen, there is privilege, there's opportunity, there's responsibility that all of us can have, that all of us can take. Everybody here can have spiritual children. Listen, 
Everybody here should have spiritual children. You should have spiritual children. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. You should have spiritual children. I, I mean it. I will never have a flesh and blood child. It will be a miracle if that happens. <laughs> Believe me, it will be a miracle on the order of Abraham and Sarah. It'll be a miracle on the order of, uh, of uh, Mary who gave birth. <laughs> It'll be a miracle. But I can tell you what I do have that satisfies my heart and my soul and gives me a future reward in heaven. I have spiritual children. We can have spiritual children. We should have spiritual children. And here's Paul talking to Timothy and he says, I constantly remember you in prayer. If you've got young people or others that you're influencing, it doesn't have to be a teenager or a child. When I say spiritual children, your spiritual child might be older than you. <laughs> okay? I have a spiritual child who is 78 years old. <laughs> Um, from years ago, from he, or, or older, um, from China, a spiritual child and a dear, dear friend. And I pray for her, <laughs> and I need to pray for her more. I'm convicted when I read that, right? I pray for you. I remember you in my prayers night and day. Look at this love relationship. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. I'll be filled with joy when we're together again. And then comes verse 5. I remember your mother, you, uh, your Laws and Eunice, and then look at what comes later. Hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you've learned from me. And then a little bit later, look what he says. He says, you, Timothy, you know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. Oh, let that sink into our hearts. You want to have spiritual children? It's going to cost something. Paul says to Timothy, you know what I teach. Words that come from our mouths can be very easy at times, but the way that we live costs something. What does Paul say? You know how I live. Do the words and the life match? And then he says, and what my purpose in life is. That's the big picture, right? My purpose in life. That's the big picture. And Paul can say to Timothy, you know these things. You know these things. And Paul with confidence can say, hold on to them. Paul imparted in Timothy spiritual DNA that, is benef that you and I are benefiting from today. We really are. We really are. Timothy continued the work. Timothy continued to establish the work. And what I want to say to you this morning, I, I really mean this. Please don't take this the wrong way. I have traveled down this road as well. Some of you long for family. You long for children. I understand that. I really do. You, you say, oh, well, no, you're a pastor. You think pastors aren't people? I understand those things. If God gives that to you, praise the Lord. If God doesn't give that to you, praise the Lord. All of us may have children that we influence and bring to the Lord. And all of them are costly, right? Those of you that are flesh and blood, parents of flesh and blood children, you know that's true, don't you? You know it's costly. And those of you that have gone on further, you know how costly it is. And those of us that have spiritual children know it's costly as well. It's going to cost something, but it's worth it. It's worth it. And we have this beautiful picture. I, I hope you are challenged by Eunice and Lois and their relationship with Timothy. I hope you are challenged by the relationship that Paul has with Timothy as well. Now look with me at this part very quickly. He says down here, he says, you know everything. You know, you know, you know. You know how, because you, you know what? If you're going to have spiritual children, you're going to have to share your life with them. You can't, it can't be long distance. It can't be at arm's length. You got to get in there with them. You really do. You really do, or else you're not going to have true spiritual children. But Paul says, you know, look with me at verse 11. What else about Timothy catches his eye? I love this verse. He says, you know how much, look with me, persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted where? In Antioch, Iconium, and ding, 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 ding. Let me remind you. Have we heard of Lystra before? First missionary journey. What happened in Lystra? Paul was preaching. There was a man lame from birth who was listening. Paul looks at him. 
prays for him and he is healed. He rises up. He starts walking. And the whole crowd in Lystra say, they're gods, they're gods. And they go get the oxen to sacrifice them. It's, it's Zeus and Hermes, his, his speaker and whatever. It's, uh, they think that Barnabas is Zeus and they think that Hermes is the speaker because that means Paul was doing most of the speaking. They're going to they're gonna sacrifice oxen. Paul and Barnabas stop them from doing that. And what happens? Just like that, the crowd turns against them. What happens in Lystra? Who is stoned and left for dead? Who? Paul. Where is Timothy from? Lystra. The same place. So when Paul says, you know how I was persecuted. Do you know what that most likely says to us? Timothy knew. Timothy saw. Timothy experienced. Here's that man that was preaching about the power of Jesus. And look at the persecution he faced. And look. He rose up after being stoned to death. And Paul says to Timothy, you know. Brothers and sisters, let that resonate in your hearts. Paul sees this young man. I think, I think that's what touched Timothy's heart. The grandmother believes first, the mother believes, and then Timothy is witness to, as far as we can see, as far as we can tell, he is witness to the persecution and the power. Let that encourage you. If persecution comes your way for the sake of the gospel, there is something that always accompanies persecution. And what is it? It is the power and the presence of God. Should hard times come in Hong Kong, and they may, all you have to do is read newspapers and listen to what all's going on. We do not yet know what is in the days ahead. There, and you can talk to anybody right now. There are people across the border now. There are people in other countries right now that are facing great persecution, that are paying the price for the sake of the gospel. But I tell you something, whether it is large scale or one-on-one, -on -one, because some of you are facing persecution in your families or in your workplaces because you are serving Jesus. Where there is persecution, there is the promise of the presence of God and the power of God. Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And a young teenager, Timothy, saw the persecution and the power of God at work. And Paul says, I want you to go with me on this trip. And I want you to see something. Parents, the cost of the gospel and, how it's, and what's worth it. Timothy had to make a choice. Paul wants to take him, but Timothy is old enough to choose. Paul has see, Timothy has seen what it cost for the gospel. He's willing because he's also seen the power and experienced the presence of Jesus. But not only Timothy, because sometimes we think, oh, young people, they make rash decisions. Do you know for young people up until about the, uh, it's about the age of 16 or so, the, the part of the brain that develops and makes decisions, choices about, is this a risk or not a risk? It's still developing. That's why sometimes young people make decisions. Parents, have you ever said to your children, what were you thinking? <laughs> they weren't. <laughs> they weren't. That, that's part of the development. Now, does it excuse them completely? No, it doesn't excuse them completely. So here's this young man. He has a choice to make. And you might say, uh, he hasn't thought about it clearly. But because he's a young man, there are other people who have a voice in his decision. And there's a mother, Eunice. Eunice was in Lystra. Eunice would have known or seen the persecution that Paul and Barnabas faced, but also the power and the presence of God. And a mother and a grandmother say yes to let go their son, to face certain persecution. Not, well, maybe yes, maybe no. Parents, are you willing for that for your children for the sake of the gospel? It's a big question. I think as parents, I, I know how I feel. I, 
and I'm not a flesh and I'm not a parent of flesh and blood children, but I think of those that I love, and I would do anything to protect them. I would do anything to keep them from harm. No, I don't want them to suffer. I don't want them to. But there are things that are worth it for the sake of the gospel. And this young Timothy says, yes, I will go. And a mother and a grandmother release him into the hands of Paul and Silas, and off they go. And as we're going to see when we get through the second missionary journey, there is great opposition. It is on this missionary journey that Paul and Silas are going to be beaten and thrown in prison in Philippi. That's the next big city that we're going to, we'll be looking at that next, the, the next time we come back to that. But because they had made a choice and because they had seen the value and the worth, out of that came a young man named Timothy that proved himself. And it's time to close, but I, I want to say this. In your notes, I encourage you to do a little more reading about Timothy. Because you know what I see when I read more about Timothy and study more about Timothy? Timothy was no Paul. You know that? He was no Paul. If you read about Timothy, you will see that Timothy was probably shy. Timothy was probably reserved. Timothy probably was reluctant to boldly step into the things and the giftings that God had for him. And some of you would say that about yourselves. You'd say, I'm not a Paul. I'm not a Pastor Renee. I'm not a Pastor Jennifer. But God needs more than Pauls. Not everybody will listen to a Paul. There are people who will listen to a Timothy. And God calls us all. And as we look at this story, as we look at this beautiful story of this young man that makes a choice, knowing part of what it's going to cost. He doesn't know all that's going to cost. We make a decision, a commitment with our hearts. But I don't want you to be afraid because God will get you through. When it's God and he calls you and you respond to God, you can trust him. You know, I've told you before, and we're going we're gonna to stop here. We're, we didn't get all the way through. We haven't gotten to the other companions. There are two more companions um, that we'll look at next time. But uh, I've told you the story before about my grandmother. Uh, that's why I think I, I love so much this story of Timothy with Eunice and with Loss, because it's the story of my grandmother and my mother. And, and you, re you recall, I think it's been a while since I've told you, that my grandmother, who came to the Lord later in life, and had four children, so she could never go on the mission field, never. But she told the Lord, uh, maybe like Eunice and Loss, she told the Lord, but Lord, I am yours and my children are yours. And she said, Lord, I, and, and this is not, a, this is not a, a missionary, I don't mean this as a missionary, I mean just as a commitment to the Lord. She said, but Lord, I, I can't go as a missionary, but you can have any one of my children to go as a missionary. And remember that in a missions meeting, they gave a missions appeal, and right at the end, as people went forward, all of these adults went forward, and right at the end was a five- or a six-year-old, I can't remember now, five- or six-year-old little girl with long braids, and it was my mother. It was my mother. And Grandma saw Mom, and she said, as a little girl, and she said, Lord, because Mary, her name was Mary, you know, she was the, she was the youngest, and my grandmother said, Lord, not Mary. She's my baby. <laughs> and God said, you said any one of them. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And I'm so grateful. Lighthouse is here in part because a grandmother made a godly commitment. Brothers and sisters, you and I, we have no idea what our commitments to the Lord will do. We don't. We just, we see so short. We see, we see we're so short-term in our outlook, aren't we? We just think, well, it's here, it's here. We have no idea what could be, what could happen if we will commit ourselves and our families and our spiritual children to the Lord. God can do anything with us, in us, and through us. Amen? You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. We can trust God. <coughs> Let's close in prayer. Amen.